Welcome everybody to our public um, event where we are going to discuss our new metric for civilian exposure to violence. It's called conflict exposure. I'm Kleena Rawley, uh, the president and CEO of ACLED, and I will be introducing the various members of our team here today, uh, including the people at ACLED who were pivotal to putting this together, Dr. Kadiyun Kishi, who will be presenting, and Andrew Lenke, who will also be uh, presenting on conflict pyramids. Of course, this work would not have been possible without Professor Andrew Tatum from WorldPOP, and we will be exploring those, um, those data later. I also wanted to wish a a strong welcome to um, some colleagues who've joined to discuss how this might be applicable in their own work. That includes Dr. Anthony Mwanze from Save the Children and Pablo Lozano Torubea from ICRC and Irene Mia from IISS. So all will be discussing in detail some of the ways in which they plan on um, approaching and using conflict exposure. Next, please. Uh, well, we have a, quite a full agenda today for our hour and a half. I'm first going to introduce this new data and the motivation behind it. We'll consider some applied examples. We're going to learn from uh, Andrew Tatum about World Pop and its data. And then Cuddy and Kishi will take us through how to access these important data and demonstrate the new calculator. We'll also be learning, of course, about how to use these data with our colleagues that I previously mentioned. And then it will be time for questions. Next, please. Okay, so what is conflict exposure? Um, very simply, it's a measure of the number of people who live around conflict events. And so, as you know, ACLED already produces information on the actual event frequency and even things like the event intensity through, through numbers like fatalities. But it has been impossible until now to get an accurate sense of how many people are affected or exposed to the violence by its incident, by location, by event type, by the type of group that is perpetuating this violence. And of course, what are the trends in this exposure? Now, what's quite important about this is that we can start making some very interesting conclusions, including some that we'll talk about today, which is that one in six of us live around armed organized violence within five kilometers of armed organized violence in the past year. And to be exposed to conflict does means that the population is living in an area of active disorder or unrest. People are harmed by this exposure in many different ways. So they may be directly injured, they may find themselves in active conflict, they or their group might be targeted, or they may be affected by the destruction of their village, neighborhood, or town. And we were very eager to try to make sure that we can deepen the understanding of violence levels by introducing this new factor of the number of people who are exposed to this violence. Next, please. So in partnership with WorldPOP, we're able to, as I mentioned, expose these trends. And here's an interesting map that gives you a, an alternative sense of how violent the world is. So this is the population exposure rate for armed organized political violence and riots within five kilometers of the event location in 2023. And what you can see here is that countries like Mexico, Brazil, and Syria, and Ukraine, and Myanmar are extremely violent. A lot of the population is exposed to at least one event of armed organized violence or conflict. But in fact, Palestine has an exposure rate of close to 100%. So almost 100% of the people living in Palestine have been exposed to violence in the past year. And of course, countries that we know of as quite violent, in fact, we find a much more of a clustering effect than we previously would have thought. Countries like, like Somalia, for example, where we have 31% of the current Somali population is exposed to active conflict. And this can tell us a lot more about how we can approach relief or how we can approach humanitarian aid that's targeted to those populations that are most exposed to violence. Next, please. I set upon creating this in order to answer three questions. First, where is exposed to violence? Second, who is exposed to violence? And third, what are the exposure trends? 
So where is exposed to violence can tell us an awful lot about the patterns, the strategies, and the variations in civilian exposure. And we can use maps, et cetera, to do that. But of equal importance is who is exposed to violence. And this assessment of risk reveals unequal and unseen exposure of civilians, which Andrew Lenke will talk about in a moment, about how different groups are differently exposed, even when they might actually experience the same number of events, but the concentration and diffusion of those events means certain groups are over or underexposed. And of course, what are the trends in this exposure? It's certainly that these this exposure is going up, as you can see from this map here. We have the population in billions that have been exposed to armed organized violence within five kilometers, steeply rising from, from 2019 to 2020, and it's continuing to be at a very high rate since that time. And this exposure rate is closely correlated to the number of events we've seen increase over that period also. Next, please. So it's very important to also indicate that to be exposed does not necessarily mean that you're repeatedly exposed to violence. In fact, being repeatedly exposed is another form of quite severe risk. Take, for example, Brazil, where what we can see here is that most populations who experience an act of violence are likely to experience another act of violence. It's quite, quite rare that those populations that have seen one act of conflict have, have a terminal act, as in an act that is not repeated. And in fact, even those populations who have had conflict in the previous year are still more likely to see repeated conflict than those who had one act in a, in a former year. And of course, this is a little bit different than Kenya, where in fact, it's quite unlikely that a group is likely to see a repeated act of violence. And it's much more likely that in fact, the violence is much more diffuse and moving and volatile than it is in a place like Brazil or Haiti. So this can tell us quite a lot about the diffusion and the concentration, not just of the events themselves, but about who is exposed. Next, please. It's an interesting example where we try to apply this, this comparison between conflict events and population exposed to a place like the Sahel. And the reason we did this is because I would like to emphasize that conflict exposure in, in our population metric here is not simply another measure of the intensity of violence. It, it has altogether different information than these other measures have had in the past. Here, for example, you can see in the gray color that there are relatively few areas where the exposure is low and the events are low. Those are the gray, the gray hexagons we see here. And those, of course, are in largely rural areas in Mali and Niger. There's also an interesting pattern to the high, high events, which is high population exposed to high number of events, or high population exposed even to low number of events. And those, of course, are in Niger, and of course, parts even of urban areas in Burkina Faso and Mali, and, and Mali which indicates that these groups are often quite inactive in some of the urban spaces. The areas which have high, high, high events and high population exposure tend to be actually in border regions or in regions of infrastructure, sig significant infrastructure that are not urban. And so what we can see here is that there's a strategy to whom and where are attacked, even in a conflict as complex as that, which is taking place within the Sahel, but we can make more sense of it from something like a ratio of exposure to events than we can through typical event counts, which are now available for, for people to use. Next, please. This is a, another exposure map of Nigeria, which of course we'll be hearing about a little bit more in the Save the Children presentation. But what I wanted to bring your attention to here is that the very dark hexagons and the large hexagons indicate a very high exposure and a high number of, of independent groups, a high number of distinct groups. And what we can see here is that one of the big reasons it's so worrying that there's an increased number of militias and gangs operating in Nigeria is that although they produce relatively low events per group, they are in fact exposing large populations to violence that intermittent or one-off groups tend not to. So with more groups, 
you get more exposure, not necessarily more violence, because they'll tend to go for populated areas first. Next, please. Here's a very interesting map where we were looking at the cumulative population exposed to conflict across Mexico. And what we find here is that the new, the Jalasco New Generation Cartel, the CJNG, is exposing a far higher number of, of Mexicans to conflict than the Sinaloa Cartel, despite the fact that Sinaloa is considered one of the largest and in fact, the, the most more successful of the cartels. But what's interesting about this is in fact where they're operating, not necessarily the number of events or the control they have over this territory. And CJNG has operated in areas that are specifically densely populated in order to achieve territorial gains outside of the areas that the Sinaloa cartel is active. Next slide, please. And what's very interesting, again, the purple areas or the purple color represents Sinaloa and the green CJNG, is that over a course of four years, from 2020 to 2023, you can see the strategy of these cartels has shifted. Not necessarily in events, as I mentioned before, but in how many people are exposed to their events as they move through that, throughout the state and over time. This, this time represents a, a particular shift in, of course, the growth of the Jalasco cartel. Next, please. I'd like to just take a moment to, to, to focus on this table that we put together yesterday. Now, I was joking with somebody yesterday that this table took me 20 years to make. And the reason is, is because for practically the entire time that ACLED has been active, one of the things that we have concentrated and, and, and emphasized is that different types of conflict can be defined by the groups engaged in that violence, their agendas, their types of diffusion patterns and activities. And this is never more obvious than in the percentage of the global population in 2023 who was exposed to conflict by these various actors. So as you can see here that state forces exposed 11% of the global population to conflict last year. Rebel and insurgent forces exposed 2% of the global population to conflict. Political militias exposed 8%, community militias 2%, mobs and rioters 9%, and external or foreign forces 1%. I'm gonna make two points with this graph. The first is that we often think in conflict analysis and conflict studies that rebel and insurgent conflict defines really the parameters of, of internal violence or of non-state violence. But as you can see here, political militias, which have been on the rise for now two decades, affect far more people than in fact rebel and insurgent violence does. There are far more political militias than there are rebels and insurgents. And we are simply often as a community not adapting to the threat that they pose and instead concentrating on rebel and insurgent threats, which are relatively contained. They're quite dangerous, as you can see with the third column, they're leading to a high number of events, but those are typically contained. Whereas both political militias, mobs and community militias are quite diverse and quite diffuse. Then my second point is that state forces and external or foreign forces have committed or are engaged in almost the same number of events. So almost 80,000, as you can see here but their actual percentage of the global population that they have exposed to violence differs vastly by over 10%. Now, the reason of course, is that in Ukraine, quite a number of the 80,000 events we see here are the Russian activity within that space. But even that Russian activity, which makes up, I believe 51,000 events from last year alone, that is exposing repeatedly a very small population to consistent violence, whereas the 79,000 or more events by state forces is exposing almost everybody who in fact is under state control over very large swathes of territory. So what you can see here is that the number of events and the percent of the global population or even the percent of the national population that is exposed to violence can differ quite significantly even though the actual number of events may be quite similar. 
So as I mentioned before, it is quite a unique variable, quite a unique measure that gets to some of the variance and how different types of conflicts have surged and which types of conflicts are intense but contained. Next, please. I'm going to hand it over now to Andrew Lenke, who's going to explain pyramids of conflict exposure. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Kalina. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, what I'll be presenting is one sort of very interesting and nuanced application of uh, these conflict data um, alongside population data. And remember, world pop details will be coming up in a moment, so you'll see how these are pieced together. But to put the application front and center, <clears throat> um, we'll start with the case of Uganda. And this is just one country, one example, one type of violence. So we can do this for all of the different types and with all of diff uh, a number of different distance thresholds. Um, but the principles are actually relatively straightforward. This is a conventional population pyramid, yeah, with uh, age cohorts, five-year cohorts from the youngest population at the bottom to the oldest population at the top. And we have the sex gender balance um, on the left and the right hand sides, respectively. So red in this case is the female population, blue uh, males. So what we do is we take these buffers around each conflict location, and we can focus not only on the number of people that have been exposed, which is what we've seen so far, um, but the demographic details of those populations that are exposed. So we know not only how many people are there, but how many five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, how many men, women, and so on, yeah. Uh, if you look at the slide on the right, we can see the baseline population for Uganda. This is what you would expect to see, right? It's a conven pretty conventional sort of progressive population pyramid with lots of younger younger folks and, and a small number of older people. Um, but we compare this, the baseline population, to the exposed population, which is on the left. And now in the horizontal axis here, the, the numbers between the left and the right vary, right? There's a much larger number of people in the general population than the exposed population, but we're talking in both cases of many hundreds of thousands of people, right? For each of these ticks on the horizontal axis. In the conflict exposed population, you'll notice, people probably have already noticed, <laughs> um, there's, there's a sort of uh, a, a bulge in the population pyramid. Yes, on the right-hand side, um, you can see that for relatively young women from 15 to 20 to 25 and up to about 30 years old, the number of people that are exposed is um, greater than that share of the normal population, right? So just to, at the risk of being a little too repetitive, you see the population pyramid you would expect to see on the right, and then you see one with what we're thinking of as a kind of uh, additional burden of conflict and additional exposure to conflict for key subsets of the population. Right. And this varies by country, it varies by year, it varies by type of violence, but this can tell us a lot of interesting things, not only about programming for um, responses, but about uh, conflict behavior, conflict targeting strategies. Um, and just very quickly before we move on, one intuitive interpretation of this, uh, this pattern, this uh, unexpected bulge in the population pyramid, um, is that in this case, in Uganda, we know that uh, violence tended to be predominantly rural and that the demographic profile of rural population skews toward younger populations and um, and women. Yes, so they're exposed, these civilians are exposed uh, to a greater rate of violence. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Uh, we can do the same kind of analysis at a subnational level. Um, so we've chosen, again, uh, just one example, one country, one year. It's a different year in this case, 2020. Um, but we have uh, in the top left panel, uh, the conflict affected population, exposed population uh, for the entire country. And interestingly, we see a similar sort of, of uh, burden for those relatively younger uh, women living in the country, right? Um, but region by region within the country, this also differs, right? This exposure rate, this burden. And so I won't interpret this right now in this presentation, in this slide, right? Um, but for, uh, excuse me, Ormea, uh, Tigre and Amhara, you can see that the population exposure uh, is different, right? And again, this can tell us something about the populations living in this regions, but it can also tell us something about um, the targeting strategies of the uh, parties that are committing these acts of violence, right? Whether the state 
forces Kalina was talking about or communal militias and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in this case, <clears throat> we're adding some additional information or we're combining information in a way that I think is also helpful to understand uh, conflict exposure. So we still have uh, in the uh, left and the right-hand side of the, the pyramid, you have the male and the female population. Um, but in this case, we're putting the baseline population and the exposed population together in, in one pyramid to try to visualize the scope of, of um, exposure, or I'm sorry, the scale, right? How, how extreme the exposure can be in some cases. Uh, so from the first map we saw, we know that some of the rates of exposure are extremely high. You know, Palestine, it's 100% and so on. Um, Syria is a case where you would expect to see a very high uh, rate of exposure overall. And that's reflected in the um, how much of each cohort's representation, the graphic is consumed by the uh, exposed population, the blue, right? Um, the point, I think, also in, in trying to interpret conflict dynamics from this type of, of analysis as a tool uh, is that we can see clearly how impactful the violence is for not only combatants, right? That's one of the key points. So we have very young populations and, you know, populations that are essentially by default civilians um, being exposed at extremely high rates. It's not only the older or, you know, middle-aged men that are affected by this kind of violence. Uh, this also helps us visualize the kinds of differences that you would expect in general uh, in the demographic characteristics of countries worldwide with a variety of levels of development and so on. So, um, you know, Mexico on the right, for example, has a much less progressive uh, population structure as Uganda did uh, that you saw from before. Um, next slide, please. Uh, at this point, we're turning it over to some of the, uh, to Andy and to some of the uh, world pop details. And this is what goes into the application that I've just uh, demonstrated. So thank you very much. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know world pop, we're a, a research group at the University of Southampton uh, and focus on bringing together different geospatial uh, demographic data sets to try and estimate and map population counts, characteristics, and mobility at, uh, at small area scales, doing that quite often in collaboration with governments and, and UN agencies. So next slide, please. Um, and the aim is really to, to fix uh, or to address some of these challenges that often exist with population data, where we may have data available, but it's at a coarse resolution, uh, or that data that does exist can be outdated, incomplete, uh, in, in, inaccurate. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of research and collaborations going on to, to try and address these issues, particularly um, directly with, with governments in situations where, where there may be conflict and data that has been uh, not collected for a long time. And next, next slide, please. And where the way we try and address this is uh, in the situation where we cannot go and collect new data, we cannot collect it every year, uh, we can't go and count everybody. Um, but what we can try and do is build up a picture of the landscape of the types of things that relate to how populations distribute themselves on the landscape. Um, so that can be uh, maps of buildings, um, vegetation data, in infrastructure. Um, if you go to the next slide, often this looks more like this in terms of a stack of geospatial data sets that describe uh, the landscape across the, the entire world. If you go to the next slide, um, these can be from a range of sources. So we're kind of riding the, the waves of uh, geospatial data science, uh, AI that's enabling us now to map uh, individual buildings, their heights and characteristics from satellite imagery, um, the range of volunteer geospatial data sources that give us information on uh, infrastructure, place names, um, satellite images themselves that tell us something about uh, images of the Earth at night, the brightness, as you can see on the top right there. Uh, and then uh, uh, there are often 20, 30, 40, sometimes 100 different geospatial data sets uh, that cover things like topography, land cover, land use. And so a lot of our work is at harmonizing, stitching these together, stacking them up to give a, a picture of the landscape. Go to the next slide. 
Uh, and this forms uh, different ingredients into then trying to estimate populations at small area scales. Uh, we need some form of population data to anchor things to. And that can be small area samples or it can be in aggregate counts. Uh, we need some data on where settlements are, where humans are not. And then within those settlements, we need that stack of data to tell us how populations distribute themselves, their densities within those settlements. And then the next slide, um, we develop uh, often bespoke types of statistical models that try and bring these together, um, quantify those relationships, and ultimately, the next slide, um, produce estimates of population at grid square scales. If you go to the next slide, um, this is really what, what we're producing, um, approximately 100 by 100 meter, though in, in the case of uh, these analysis, we are working at a one kilometer scale um, of uh, estimates of population uh, for each one of those grid squares. And obviously the uncertainties are, are huge when we're estimating for an individual grid cell, um, but the value of these types of data, if you go to the next slide, is being able to aggregate to different types of units, whether it's administrative units, health units, enumeration areas, uh, numbers of people within the, the boundaries of a, a settlement. Um, and an example here in the case of what we're talking about today, is being able to identify numbers of people within proximity of a certain uh, feature or event. So the example here is health facilities, um, but what we're talking about today is obviously uh, conflict events. Now, next slide, please. Um, and just to visualize the process of one type of, of modeling that we, we're using here in, in these analysis, um, here's an area of Northern Vietnam. Each one of these administrative units has a population count, but there can be somewhere around half a million or a million uh, in, in many places. Very difficult then to be able to integrate uh, with the location data from ACLED to identify how many people are exposed within a small area. So on the next slide, what we do have is this stack of the geospatial data sets. So we have information on buildings mapped from satellites to tell us likely that the populations are within those gray or white areas. We don't know their, their densities, and this is where other layers can come in. So on the next slide, we have things like um, land cover that can tell us something about population densities. We also have on the next slide, things like images of the earth at night that can tell us about electrification, about uh, different densities. And on the next slide, um, we then go from this aggregate counts, where sometimes we're having a million people in each one of those units. We're learning those statistical relationships with the stack of geospatial data sets at the finer spatial resolution using machine learning approaches. Uh, and on the next slide, we're then uh, <coughs> using that stack to then, uh, on the next slide, disaggregate to the 100 by 100 meter grid squares. And so, um, Within the analysis we're presenting here today, we're making use of global data sets um, that we've produced. Um, we see the next slide that involve uh, an assembly of um, age and sex structured subnational census data, official estimates, projections um, across the world. And we're right in the middle of a process at the moment of uh, collecting millions more of these units from the 2020 round of censuses. Um, but this gives us aggregate counts across the entire world. And on the next slide, we also collect and make use of household survey data in the areas uh, where we don't have good age and sex structure data, um, and sometimes census microdata, some often census data that gives us those age and sex breakdowns for small subnational areas. And the next slide, please. Um, we also then are gathering together these geospatial data sets across the, the time period. So just an example here from mapping settlements in, in Vietnam across the 20 year period to be able to capture some of those changes that have happened uh, across the time periods we're looking at. So on the next slide, please. Um, this then produces these global data sets. So uh, an estimate of number of people uh, each uh, one by uh, 100 by 100 meter grid square. Um, you can access these in, in ArcGIS in the UNFPA population data portal and the, the health information systems used by many governments um, on HDX and, and Google Earth Engine. If we go to the next couple of uh, slides, you see this is, this is really what the data look like. You get uh, for each grid square, um, that's age and sex structure. Um, so just to finish off, there are many resources um, that you can go to to uh, 
uh, explore those data sets to uh, do training yourself. Uh, and of course, this is an, an active research area and we're continuing to update these data sets, particularly in some of those conflict affected countries where, where conflict itself can result in changes of those populations. So integrating displacement data, for instance. So I will finish there and hand over, I think, to Katayun. Great, yeah, so now we have a good sense, I think, of the what the, the meaning of the exposure variable really is, what can be done with it, um, sort of the, the richness that we can get from uh, the analysis of it and where it sort of comes from. So I can go into how you can use it, essentially, um, how you can access these and how we essentially came up um, with these metrics and applied it to our data. So. When you look at the ACLID data and you download it, you'll see all of our typical columns relating to the information about the event. And at the end, you have the option of, of adding on the population um, information, and it will give you the estimates of the one, two, and five kilometer radius um, of the conflict event, as well as a best estimate. So essentially what we did here was we took the coordinate information about the event that you normally see when you look at ACLID data, and we essentially drew a one, two and five kilometer buffer around that location, um, taking into account other locations that are close by, clipping these borders so they don't overlap and we don't over aggregate. So a lot of steps were taken to sort of be conservative um, in the estimates that we we're providing. So that's what you'll see next to each uh, event in the data set all the way back to 2020. And then we have a best estimate, which is sort of our way of streamlining this information for you um, to give you a sense of what we think is the most appropriate population estimate to use for each of the different kinds of events. So here we're taking into account the type of event it is or the intensity of the event, and then estimating what we think, whether the one, the one or the two or the five kilometer buffer is most appropriate. So for something that's quite a high intensity event, such as an armed clash in a battle, um, we would recommend using the five kilometer radius, so the largest radius we offer. Whereas an event like a peaceful protest, for example, a relatively low intensity event, we would recommend using the one kilometer. So the best estimate there is there for you to sort of get our sense of what we would recommend, but of course we offer all of the, the estimates themselves. So um, on the website, which I'll, I'll share with you in a minute, what the landing page looks like, you can also look at our methodology information that goes into a lot more depth about what I just discussed and how we calculated these metrics and what exactly they mean. Um, and we also allow for the calculation by essentially by location, but then also by the group and the time range and the event type that there are via the new um, conflict exposure calculator that I'll be sharing in a minute as well. So how you can act access this information. Essentially, there's three different ways um, that you can download it. So you can download it via the data sort of in the typical way in the export tool that we have on our website. You'll see an option there to add on the population data information. Um, you can download it that way. You can download it via the API. You can add a parameter to the typical API call to indicate that you would like to receive the population estimates alongside your data. And then the most user-friendly way is using the calculator option um, to kind of quickly input the information that you're interested in and then get a quick answer back. And so I'll share that now. Bear with me while I switch screens. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. So this is the, the landing page that you'll see on the ACLID website. Um, when you go to the data tab at the top here, you'll see conflict exposure. This is where you can get all the information that you need about what this variable is, how it was calculated and how to access it. So you'll see here all the, the information that you need. And when you scroll down, you have the conflict exposure calculator. So say you are trying to do some analysis and you want a quick answer um, to how the, the exposed populations differ by province or by admin one uh, within a country. You can go through these simple prompts here. So for example, here we're interested in the admin one level. So we wanna compare provinces. We want to see all the different admin ones. We can select the country that we're interested in. So for example, Myanmar. We can select all of the admins because we want to see how the exposed population um, is impacted across the board. 
And we can leave the default time setting um, just to the last year, but you could also extend this all the way back to 2020 if you'd like. So here you see a quick rundown um, of all the exposed populations for each admin within Myanmar in the last year. And you can sort this table as well. So for example, you can sort from largest to smallest. You can then quickly see which admins have the largest number of exposed um, population, and then also how many events are we seeing there as well. So that gives you an additional sense um, of whether or not these are incidents of repeated exposure um, or sort of one-off events. So for example, in Yangon admin one, you have a large number um, of people impacted or, or exposed to the conflict, but a relatively small number of total events. Whereas in this province here, you have, again, a large number of people impacted and a large number of total events as well. So if we reset the filters, and of course my internet is disconnecting, I'll reload the page. It may be due to the amount of interest in the calculator at this moment. I'm sure everyone is simultaneously logging on <laughs> trying to look at it. Well, in any case, we can we can pause it there. Um, but the other elements of the calculator that you can use include filtering down by event type, for example. So you can select a specific country and perhaps you're interested in battles or explosions or remote violence. And you can see the number um, of exposed people to those types of events specifically. You can also filter um, by the actor as well. So say you're interested in events that involved political militias in an area, how many people are exposed to those types of events or even specific actors as well. You can see how many people were exposed to events that involved the Islamic State, for example. So with that, we'll go back to the presentation. Wonderful. And pass it along. Um, I'm hoping Yes, thank you so much. And uh, please do take a look both at the page and at the calculator. The page itself has a wealth of information covering what um, Andrew Tatian was talking about and covering some of the details I was talking about about the application. Um, and so there's quite a lot there also about the methodology behind the event collection, but also the grafting of these two data sets together. So now we will turn to our esteemed guest colleagues who will be speaking about the application of this work. We're we'll begin with Pablo from ICRC and then to Irene from IISS and of course then to Anthony from Save the Children. And um, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Pablo Lozano from, from ICRC. So I think I'll, I'll just speak briefly. I mean, uh, Having looked at uh, at this uh, new uh, exposure variable, you know, how it has been constructed, all the work uh, behind it, I think it's also now time for us, uh, as uh, it has been released recently, to to reflect on how, how we're going to make use of this, you no, know, how it's going to help in our work, in in different settings, you no, know, as a consumer of of these data. I think for us, it, I would start by saying that we we aim at using ArcLED data in different settings, mostly, I would say, around two pillars. No, First, in, understand, in increasing our understanding of, of the impact of, on the conflicts uh, where we are present on the civilian population to, to support mostly programming, uh, but also to develop a better understanding of the hostilities of, of the different actors no? to also support our confidential uh, bilateral dialogue with, with all parties to, to the conflict. No, And I think this uh, exposure variable takes us a step further into that. No, I think uh, well, we still need to reflect a lot on how we concretely use it. What we know is it's that it's very hard to to measure or to to understand impact or to understand behavior based on uh, other indicators, no, such as conflict intensity, fatality counts. No, I think we we know these are important. But we know that they don't necessarily connect well with the impact of such a conflict dynamics on the civilian population, no? even when they are not um, directly targeted or, or affected. No? So I think first point for me is that this will allow us to move the analysis from conflict dynamics, from counting events, to focus on the people affected, no? which for us is quite a, quite a step change, no? being able to assess 
uh, an estimate uh, the, the number of people affected by these events and how the different actors and the different uh, steps of the conflict are, are coming into, into the picture. No? And I think today already we saw a very inspiring example no? on these population pyramids and, and that takes it uh, to, to understand the, the consequences of the conflict and how these are different for different uh, population groups as well. No? I think in addition to that, uh, this, this will be a key factor in complementing our first-hand understanding of the, of the conflict. No? So we have teams uh, all over the world uh, working with communities affected by conflict, collecting first-hand information, getting a first-hand impression on that. So this exposure variable will allow us to give a, a context, uh, an overview of what's happening at a higher level, no? how, how the communities that we support are affected by that. And well, one of the, the key reflections, no, looking at the graph that we see, you know, that was discussed before, is uh, the, how the different actor types uh, come into the picture here. No, I think we all have our own biases, we all have our own understanding of these conflict dynamics, but I think as we zoom in more and more, and as we break down this um, these table, we will be able to better understand how the different types of actor engage uh, with, with each other, uh, affect the civilian population as the, as the conflict evolves, and also to better understand uh, their behavior. No? I think for us it's very important, I mean, for the ACSC, uh, as, a, as a guardian of international humanitarian law, no? we, we aim to understand as much as possible the conduct of hostilities, uh, the, the behavior of, of the different uh, weapon bearers. But I think it's also important not only to focus on 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 the bad practices and the bad aspects. No, I think we we will be looking at the different actors and their interactions with the civilian population to understand higher impact, to understand more issues of concern, but also to identify positive behaviors. No, when we see actors taking precautions, minimizing exposure to the civilian population in different settings, so that we can enrich also our dialogue. With the with the part with the parties to the conflict, again putting the people affected the, at the at the center of the discussion, and then just one last point from from my side, which I think this this will also allow us is to to look at the different drivers of vulnerability together. No, I think for us it's quite important to be able to identify population groups and communities that are most impacted by by conflict, and we know that. Conflict doesn't come alone. No, we we know that there, there are many different drivers uh, interconnected. No food insecurity, displacement, conflict, uh, climate issues, and I think this will again allow us to people pe uh, putting people at the center of this analysis better understand where the highest vulnerabilities, where the people most at, at risk are, and inform our our programming in also in a setting of, of limited resources that that we all face. So I think I'll, I'll leave it here um, and I'll hand over to Irene, I believe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pablo. Uh, and thanks thanks for, uh, for the invitation of being here. Uh, Karin, I really I want to, first of all, congratulate you and the team for this new terrific indicator. Um, as at the WRL, as just a quick word of what we do for people who are not familiar with our work, uh, we are um, tracking and trying to provide an, a strategic understanding of conflict. We produce this armed publication, which is called the Armed Conflict Survey, and it's uh, uh, it's actually a report which cover all active conflict and tries to identify, um, you know, both the, the, the domestic and uh, and. Uh, global drivers, but also the, the trends, the dynamics, the, the future hotspot, and also interconnection among, among conflicts. So of course, we are keen users of, uh, of applied data, uh, especially violent events and related fatalities. Uh, those um, data in particular are really uh, providing unique insight to the form, frequency, and intensity of conflicts, as Clean I mentioned already. Uh, and these insights, incidentally, are a key input for us to decide which, can, which country of conflict actually makes it to the report and are considered as armed, uh, um, as armed conflict. Um, I would say that this indicator, this indicator, the way I see it, um, I, I took uh, uh, very, very kindly uh, the accurate team shared with us in advance uh, all the documentation around the indicator. So I had, I had a close look and my team had a close look as well. So we were all very excited. But it's really, I think what, what is going to be really extremely valuable and to add to what Pablo said, 
it's really going to be a contribution to a more comprehensive understanding of conflict dynamics, especially with respect to the human impact of conflict. So by mapping the extent of population exposed to conflict, their demographics and gender, but also the type of factors which are the one that expose most population to, uh, to, to, to conflict or to, or to um, armed violence, um, we really think that there's going to be much more visibility on what are the real dynamics uh, of, of the conflict. In terms of application, I see with respect to our specific research agenda and the WSS, but I think in general to the study of conflict, I would say for us, the first thing has to do with uh, what we try to do with our work, which is assessing the global relevance of conflict. We do that, um, I mean, in a very in a very rudimentary way, because of course there are very different uh, um, uh, element of uh, of you know the the, the 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 impact of conflict, the human impact. But we what we try to do is we try to identify what is the global relevance of conflict as a way to prioritize our analysis on different conflicts. We have a composite indicator, very basic, which is called uh, the Armed Conflict Global Relevance Indicator, quite a long name. But basically, it assesses the global relevance of conflict, looking at three different dimensions. One is obviously visual political impact, which is maybe the most visible, but also the intensity and the human the human impact of conflict. The human impact is for us a crucial a crucial aspect of when it comes to assess the, the global relevance of uh, of a camp of a conflict. Because the spillovers in terms of human losses of forced displacement I have a very important um, impact on uh, global stability and security. Therefore, for us, it's key to assess this, this element of the global impact, the, 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 the human impact of, of conflict. And so far, we use as proxies to assess this, um, uh, this, this impact. Uh, we use refugees, IDPs, and also fatalities. But I think these new indicators will actually provide a much more granular um, assessment of this of this human impact because if you look even at this uh, this uh, table that very kindly the Agri team has put together for me it, it actually gives you a, a sense of how conflict which maybe we don't necessarily think as um conflict per se and i'm thinking about the the one in latin america haiti or you know brazil as we had before mexico they're actually among the the most impactful from a from a human uh, point of view so i think this is actually something we need to really understand and also um make people understand what is the the, the global relevance of some conflict some conflict which maybe are not perceived as such for instance some I'm, I'm seeing at haiti it's quite impactful to see haiti third after Palestine and Lebanon. So that's definitely one of the way which we are planning to use or explore to use to be using more this uh, indicator. The second uh, dimension, I think, uh, uh, for which an indicator would be very useful for us, but also in general for the, for the conflict uh, um, expert and, and practitioner, it's really providing more insight into non-state armed groups. Um, as other institution and, uh, and expert and practitioner closely monitoring conflict trends, we have noted the growing geoeconomic and geopolitical cloud of those groups, as well as their increasing importance as provider of governance and services. So many times it's replacing, but sometimes competition with the, with the state. So in our report, we are providing some standardized data. We are trying to, 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 to provide some standardized data on non-state non, 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 um, armed, um, armed groups across the world, all of the categories we have. We have discussed earlier on, uh, you know, from militia to uh, to to insurgent and to criminal groups, uh, but also we have been trying more and more to really gain visibility and insight into their activities, their strategies, their linkages across the world um, as driver of conflict and political instability. So this indicator, I think, will complement very much the great data from uh, Pablo and the ICRC on uh, on. Um, non-state armed groups numbers and uh, and territorial control, which is which is um, as well really really helpful, and we are using it very much in our in our study. But it will really help us to get a sense of what are the better understanding of what the specific groups are doing, what are their operation, where do where do they operate. It was quite interesting this the the, the slides on the on the Mexico case, whereby you could actually see a different human impact of, uh, of the two main cartels in, uh, in Mexico. And I think this we can do for all the countries, right? So it's going to be really interesting to help us uh, identifying also what are the groups which are the most um, impactful from a, from a human impact point of view. The third point I wanted to make, uh, um, it's, and it's related to the non-state armed group dimension and the complexity of conflict nowadays, 
has to do with uh, uh, the work uh, that we are doing and other organizations are doing on, uh, on what we call the continual war, right? We all know that conflicts are becoming much more prolonged and much more complex. We see that conflicts are not linear anymore. We don't have a pre-conflict, conflict and post-conflict. We see we see more like a continuum between between uh, war and peace in many in many in most of the cases of conflict or you know um, fragile uh, states nowadays. So I think one of the things we need to do as conflict um, expert and practitioner is really trying to understand this continuum better. And also trying to understand, given this kind of different um, back or backdrop, what are the most impactful or the most effective intervention, post-conflict intervention, or you know, um, uh, stabilization or reconstruction and, and recovery intervention in conflict-affected countries. Uh, and I think the conflict exposure indicator again will actually help us um, identifying the conflict with the largest human impact, as we as we have seen to start with. But also, what are the main, uh, the most affected geographies or demographics within a country, and what are the groups which are the most responsible for those for those trends? So this actually provides once again a fantastic tool to identify priorities for intervention, uh, but also um, an important granular input for research most effective um, intervention according to the specific needs and specific situation of each country. And I uh, and I'll stop here. Uh, once again, thanks so much. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic indicator. We are really looking forward to uh, using it more. Thank you so much, Irene. We're going to turn now to Anthony from Save the Children. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Anthony Wanze. I'm the Senior Child Protection Technical Advisor for Save the Children in Nigeria. I'm based in Abuja, Nigeria. And I'll be taking you through the use of the ACLEC conflict exposure measure for child protection in armed conflicts. You know, when we talk about save the children, we talk about our vision, children, basically. And our vision is um, a world where every child attains their right to survival, protection, and development, including participation. Next slide, please. Hence, um, what's next slide? Yeah, so we, because we are interested in children, no, the, the, the previous one, this slide two. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because we are interested in children, hence we are interested in how um, conflict affects children. And um, what comes to mind basically is the impact of um, conflict on children. And some of the impact you could see is the increase in family separation, attacks on school, um, children are recruited into armed groups. You have issues of um, poverty and you have children engaging in hazardous child labor. The next slide, please. So uh, I'll be explaining the, 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 the use of the complete exposure measure and I'll be zeroing it into Nigeria. And I'll be talking about the discontinued exposure and also the child focused intervention. Uh, you know, exposure to conflict is not uniform. Even in Nigeria, we have six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. And you find out that this conflict is not uniform even within this region, facing similar issues and uh, revealing complex layers of impact on, on the affected population. For example, in Kaduna State, some areas might have hotspot for communal conflict, which is predominant, which is the predominant form of violence, followed by the state violence. And uh, why others are relatively peaceful despite the overall high level of violence. Now, this means that the assistance like emergency shelter needed to be directed to specific neighborhood rather than, um, rather than uniformly across the states. Now, the, the high incidence of communal violence in Kaduna State, for example, suggests that children in this area may be at risk of witnessing or being involved in more violence and uh, state engagement could lead to risks such as being caught in crossfire or collateral damage during counter action. I don't know if you follow through uh, news in Nigeria, there was an error from the Nigerian army where a drone attack really killed um, almost 100 persons with mostly women and children in Kaduna State. 
This is as a result of the counter action of government. Now, this exposure to this type of um, to this type of violence could result in orphanhood, displacement, and interruption of education. And what do we do as Save the Children when we have this data? We want to implement youth empowerment program. We want to implement um, provide psychological support, mental health and psychological support, support rehabilitation for affected individuals, and strengthening community-based child protection um, mechanism. Let's look at um, the second, the child focus intervention, that is the second map, thanks. Now, now, children exposure to conflict demand specialized intervention plan, and this should address both the direct impact and uh, the direct impact like displacement, an indirect impact like psychological trauma. For example, if you look at the, the data, one good thing about this data is that we have a whole lot of data from different parts of the country that you can that you can play with that can help you make informed decisions. For example, in River State, uh, the primary violence is military violence. Now, children in River State might be exposed to violence perpetrated by gangs or, or politically motivated group impacting their safety and psychological well-being. So um, based on this data, the recommendation from child protection point of view is that we can have child-focused intervention that would include community psychosocial support, establishment of child-friendly spaces so that children can feel safe and they can continue their, their um, education. Um, the next slide, please. Now, I'll, I'll be looking at um, the demographic data. I'll be looking at uh, the uh, acclaimed conflict exposure measure, looking at the demographic impact measurement and the variability in conflict exposure. Now, uh, data on the number of people affected by age, gender, allows for precise identification of those risks. This information is crucial for crafting targeted support mechanism. For example, in Bono states, where we have extremely high insurgence activity, as, as well as state violence, that means government trying to respond to the, to the activities of the armed group, there are supposed likely increase in the risk of children to be subjected to um, recruitment into armed groups, children and uh, adoption of children, and attack on school, including hospital. Now, the presence of the state forces suggest that children in this area might be at risk of witnessing or being caught in crossfire during state operation against insurgents or other armed groups to response. So targeted intervention should establish safe spaces or education program aimed at keeping the demographics out of the armed group reach or program aimed at pro protecting recruitment of children. If you look at the, 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 the age range, you find out that young people are mostly exposed. So projects or programs should, the data gives inform, uh, information on where, how do we ensure that children are not accessible to the armed group. So we have programs, education programs that can also divert the attention of the student or the, the armed group having access to these children. For example, in River State, another state in Nigeria, the demographic data suggests that young, so that young adults, both male and female, are exposed to militia violence, basically. And our recommendation from the child protection point of view is that the conflict burden appear to be substantial for this younger demographic population, indicating that intervention in river states should prioritize the protection and support of adolescents who are at the critical stage of development and may be vulnerable to various risks associated with armed violence, including disruption of their education, psychological trauma, and potential involvement in armed groups. And quickly, I will talk about the variability of the conflict exposure. Now, each Nigerian region exhibits unique conflict signature, now indicating diverse exposure level. This pattern necessitate tailored regional strategy to conflict response. For example, in Kaduna, the conflict is predominantly communal with high number of incidents 
whereas in Bono is characterized by insurgent violence with fewer but more intense incidents. This contrast requires strategies in Kaduna that focus on community mediation and in Bono, we focus on child ensuring that children are not recruited into AMRU. The next slide, please. So uh, I'll just quickly talk about the broader application for, 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 for us who are consuming this data. This data can help us for community engagement. It can help us identify high risk area. Uh, you can plan for anticipatory action because you have this data, this information. Now you can design, it can help you design having, the, having both the conflict, conflict exposure measure and the population uh, um, um, pyramid. It helps you to have a child-centric design. It also helps advocacy, advocacy because we have information of where the violence are coming from, and you can reach out to those that need to do something to ensure we have reduction. Then donor engagement, this is where we tell donors, this is where the needs are. If you support with this funding, it can help reduce violence. And finally, it helps to design a risk uh, mitigation. I will want to pause here if there are any questions. I can hand over back. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, here's a note about some of the people who work with us to have to have created the conflict exposure metric. And with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Hugh, who will lead us in our Q&A. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello, everyone from Brussels. My, uh, my name is Hugh Pope. I'm uh, with External Affairs at ACLED. And I've been seeing all the uh, questions coming in. And uh, uh, in fact, most of them have been answered already by the panelists on a one-to-one -one basis. But I think there's some really interesting ones. So I'm going to pick them out and I, I'll come to you first, if I may, Lena. Um, Maxim Gleisel asks, what do you mean exactly by political militias and do you mean pro-government militias? And uh, how uh, Paul Gruet asks, uh, how do you distinguish the categories when collecting the data, uh, do, especially between the types of militias and the, uh, and the different kinds of rebels and insurgents? Sure. Yes, that's a great question. Um, we have an extensive, extensive knowledge base on the website, so quite a lot of the details about our coding process are available there. But I do want to go over that important distinction between an insurgent rebel and what a militia is, and then the different forms of militias we create. So a rebel or an insurgent is a group that has a national ambition and tends to act nationally. So their motive or their agenda is to challenge the central state, um, either to replace them in government or to establish a different government. Um, and that tends to that that's a lot to take on. You know, that that particular political agenda is is quite a large one. But what we're often finding is groups that are either hired by different political elites or work at the behest of a political interest are much more active. And they these are militias who might be op operational around elections or to protect different political elites in their position or, or are hired violent labor, which is what we're seeing in a lot of areas. And they can grow from gangs or they can grow from more community-based militias who often have a, a security element within their own communities. But they tend to be those that have a political agenda that's closely tied to a location and a time period and a particular political elite or leader, rather than one that is about a national political change. Um, and so in many ways, cartels are much closer to political militias who have grown expansively uh, with a business agenda than, than we find rebels are. And then community militias, as I mentioned, are those that have an, a hyper-local focus, often over one particular defined group and their role either in um, engaging in attacks at the behest or rather representing that group or, or receiving those attacks. I hope that's clear. But there is, I've written many papers about it that I'm happy to share. <laughs> a small follow-on question from Jacques Salomon. Uh, having seen your Mexico example, do you have any specific analysis of Haiti that would help uh, uh, focus on the population and the strategies of the gangs there over time? 
So that's a great question. Um, so we do not have a specific population um, analysis of Haiti thus far, but we, we are deep in consideration about setting up um, more concerted work on Haiti. And with that will come a full and extensive investigation to the different forms of violence, the different groups and their exposure levels, or rather the exposure they create within the community. So um, that that person should contact me and I will make sure to send them that, that material. Thank you. Um, Andrew at the University of Utah, Rachel Monahan asks about the the uh, conflict pyramids and is wondering about specifically the x-axis, but perhaps you could talk more generally about uh, how you design them and uh, what, what the main benefits of them are. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, thanks, Hugh. Um, the, so the population size is on the horizontal axis. And in one, in one of the examples uh, included in the slides, uh, it doesn't contain values because when we compare to the baseline population, of course, the baseline population is generally much larger. So it's a different scale, if you want to think of it that way, than the exposed population. Um, displaying them together in the combined pyramids that included the baseline and the exposed population in one graph, I think is helpful. And um, <clears throat> I can say that in work on the side, <clears throat> we're establishing uh, ways to determine how uh, statistically significant, for lack of a better term, the difference between the exposed population and the baseline population is, because in some cases for certain cohorts, it may not be, but in others, we are quite certain that it, that it is, right, that there's this additional burden. Um, so there's more um, intensive quantitative work to establish the reliability of those relationships. Um, but I guess just in 30 seconds or so, um, the background uh, for calculating these pyramids is just that we use the same buffers as the uh, buffers used to count the total population. It's only that within each one of these world pop pixels that Andy had discussed about great detail, uh, we also just know the number of people in every single one of those age cohorts. So to operationalize this, it's just a calculation of the values for all the pixels within the buffer, it just adds an additional layer of sophistication to, you know, the number of people. Instead, it's the number of people disaggregated um, by sex and gender. Yeah, I mean, and age. Excuse me. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andrew. And staying with population, turning to to Andy, we've had a question about uh, the conflict calculator. Obviously, the exposure calculator. Uh, obviously looks at the five events that you can see on the page there. And uh, Alberto Sibilo was wondering, what else is this kind of uh, world population statistic used for? Perhaps you can give some examples of how else it can be used. I mean, the, the population data on its own, or yeah, uh, I mean, we <clears throat> we have a, um, yeah, quite a growing, Use of that kind of data in the health field, for instance, they've been they've been used for estimating um, uh, populations of children under five for vaccination campaigns. Um, they've fed into national statistics. Um, they've been used for for resource allocation, um, for uh, estimating numbers women's access to health facilities. Um, so the, the the value here is it's is the flexibility of integrating with other data sets. So. Um, yeah, UNICET and UNITAR use these for estimates of populations exposed to disasters. So overlaying um, fires, conflicts, uh, sorry, not just fires, floods, um, earthquake zones. Uh, so yeah, the, the, um, yeah the, op the options are quite limitless, I guess, in terms of anything where you you have another type of data that can be mapped and integrated to understand populations exposed or, or There effect. were quite a few questions too, Andy, about um, this one from Abu Bakr Hema, but how do you know the age and the sex of the population in such detail everywhere? I'm sure that you have a short mm -hmm. answer for that, but uh, it's, there were a number of questions about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think we know. That's that's the first thing to say. These are all estimates, and the the reliability and accuracy of those vary by country, by region. Um, as I showed in the presentation, we are integrating a whole set of different sources of data. Uh, and obviously, in some countries, there's been a very recent census, 
and that data is available at very small administrative unit levels. And so all we're doing is, is turning that into grid squares uh, and main, really maintaining those data. In some cases, uh, for instance, let's say the Democratic Republic of Congo, the last census was 1984. Um, there's very uncertain projections um, and so there um, we are making a lot of assumptions about how the population has grown over time, those age and sex structures. Um, but in, in many of those countries, those are the ones where we are partnering with uh, the government's the statistics offices to work out ways to do estimation. So mapping of uh, the individual buildings, uh, small area surveys to estimate building occupancies, uh, and then bespoke types of models to, to actually uh, come up with independent estimates um, where there hasn't been a census for, for a long time. Thank you so much. Um, turning to you, Katayun, uh, you've built this machine um, and uh, you've been answering questions about how it works exactly uh, in, in the chat, but uh, there's been a couple of questions about how long the time period is that an event covers that uh, there's the ACLED event, and uh, is is that just for the date that it happens? Uh, and uh, another subsidiary question is, do you follow what happens next? Can you see where the population moves to? Is that something that uh, uh, this machine can can see? So the, the calculator does not take into account um, migration flows or displacement, essentially. Um, so that often is quite difficult to capture in terms of the data as it's happening. Um, and we often also find that people are not being, when, when people are displaced due to conflict, it's often not very far from where they originally sort of um, were from as well. So we, it's one of the elements that we're sort of looking into in future iterations, building in, um, in terms of being able to factor the displacement estimates. But um, no, at this time, it does not take that part into account. Um, as far as the events go, so the calculator allows you to capture any date range of events. So any events that occurred on a day within the range that you're indicating um, all the way back from 2020 until present. Um, and the events themselves are typically bounded by a time and a place. So each accolade event occurs in a single location at a single point in time. Um, so they're, they're sort of bounded in that way. Um, we don't have events that a single event that ranges, you know, over the course of an entire month, you would see that disaggregated over the exact days um, on which it occurred. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have a large panel, so I'm going to keep going around to Irene, and you've already uh, spoken about how the um, the exposure metric is is uh, already feeding into your understanding and how you're working uh, with that big annual survey that. Uh, you do every year. How do you think this is going to change our perception of conflict over time, having these kinds of very detailed views of, uh, of things that go way beyond the old way we used to see things as just the number of people who died? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, I think in general, what we try to do, and it's, you know, with, with, with the report, which is tracking year after year, it's a way to do that, even if it's a more from a qualitative point of view. I think this is going to really add understanding on what the what the what the situation the changing situation is on uh, on uh, on the ground and as we know in some of these cases the so this 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 conflict actually morphed into different type of conflict there are more and more more and more groups getting involved so I think it would really it would really help um, getting a better and a com more comprehensive more granular understanding of the dynamics on the ground and as I said. Uh, also will be actually a very good tool to, to decide where are the priorities for the international community. Also, we know that, you know, obviously development, develop, development and aid and uh, humanitarian fund is uh, is going to become increasingly less, especially for for the less covered um, conflict. So I think it's it will be, it will be a great tool uh, to help us prioritize together with, you know, obviously qualitative analysis and other tools. Thanks very much, Irene. And turning to 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 you, Pablo, that using uh, using this potentially using this calculator for ICRC's such important work on the ground, um, you said that it would be useful to you in analysing the impact on civilians, but not yet necessarily for your confidential negotiations when you seek to arrange things between the parties on the ground. However, on the the Mexico example, it was quite clear that over time you could see new 
patterns of activity by the cartels in, in Mexico, at least. Uh, do you think that in the future, this, this tool might be useful for analyzing the strategies that the various conflict actors are using? Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I think we, we are already uh, looking into this. Uh, I think, well, we like most, uh, like our, our main source of information for that uh, bilateral and confidential dialogue is, is our primary data, but definitely we rely on uh, sources like ACLE, no? and especially now with this uh, new variable, I think we will be able to access more advanced analysis on what's the actual impact on the civilian population of those behaviors. No? So definitely, I think it will enrich as we, as we progress, as we get a better understanding of the data set, it will definitely enrich our dialogue. And it will also enrich our policies and our understanding of how we can best en engage uh, different parties to the conflict. Uh, so just a follow on, do you, do you think that uh, conflict actors are very conscious of their impact on civilians? Is that is this useful from that perspective that uh, there's a that uh, we often think of, of conflict actors trying, trying to knock each other out? Do you think that civilians are actually a, a really important part of it? Yeah, that, that is a very difficult uh, question. Uh, for sure, for sure, they they are aware, they are conscious, uh, and I think for us, one of the priorities is to to be able to to engage in that dialogue, to to find mechanisms to to reduce exposure, uh, and to to see to 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 ensure that they can understand that they can take action and they can take precautionary measures to to protect the civilian population. No, so I think definitely there is a consciousness. Not, not all actors are, are equal for sure uh, and and it is it is our analysis no through through better understanding of how this behavior translates into impact on the civilian population displacement degradation of essential infrastructure no and how it is their responsibility to to protect the civilian population that we can we can enrich that dialogue thank you so much turning to you and abuja uh... Anthony, um, you're actually on the ground using, uh, reaching real people. And uh, do you think having this tool is is uh, going to change the day-to-day -day work of a, of, of a charity like your own? Really, it's, it's, it's going to change the dynamics of what we do. And uh, importantly, is to identify the needs of each group and each population that we are targeting. For example, if you look at the, the, the population pyramid, it shows you uh, the, the population, the most population that are much more affected by conflict. So this influences our design, our programming, so it gives us insight and we can invest or the, the resources we have to meet the needs of the children. So this is very critical for us in the sense that it helps us to ensure what are the needs of male, female, for example, what are the needs of various communities. And like I said, we can communicate this to the donor. We can use that to design our project implementation. We can ensure that the limited and greatly resources is utilized um, well. And for us, um, this data, which for us is life, um, goes a long way to actually improve the quality of what we do and the impact of our work on the children on the ground. Yeah. Thank you. Turning back to you, Klina, you've, you've introduced a number of innovations in the way, the expansions, I should say, of, of how data is used to, to, to look at conflict. conflict and, it seems that you've been steadily building up this idea of diffusion and exposure. What is it that makes it so important to you that to to have this exposure indicator as we look at conflict? Oh, that's a really good question. I suppose that um, I suppose that when we were building ACLED and we were concentrating on the event types and then, of course, the characteristics of the actors and how we can understand the signature of conflict, as Anthony was talking about before, it occurred to me that, that when we speak, especially to people who work on the ground, they might, might be interested in conflict dynamics, but they are working on conflict exposure, or they're working on conflict harm and impact. 
And so a way in which we could create a bridge to what they need and what we had was to was to assess these population these populations that were under harm and um i do a lot of analysis here and i was constantly trying to add population data to every one of my conflict files and i thought if i'm doing it it means also everybody else is doing it so i might as well just do it once with Kadian's help of course and with with a lot of the insight from from the people that we mentioned were really pivotal in creating it but it would be it would it would solve a lot of the data interoperability problems that people have. So it had both a logistical um, motive, but also one where I just think that we're often trying to figure out what the what the actual larger impact of a conflict event or a conflict act or a conflict um, actor is, and this can tell us that much more so than any sort of other generalizable indicator I can think of. Um, actually, I just wanted to note about something that we intend, as, as mentioned earlier, we intend on expanding this, not only to, of course, integrate more of the pyramid information that, that Andrew presented, but also to very specifically look at things like the gendered effect of violence and then the age cohorts effect, so like Anthony is using. And the reason that this is important is that I hate to say it, but there are limits to events. You, know, there, you really do need more to understand a conflict environment. And one of the problems we constantly run into is somebody might ask, well, what gendered information do you have about conflict? And it's very difficult to have an event, have a gendered perspective, in part because we know we know both genders are affected. We know that uh, you know large cohorts across the spectrum are affected. What we often don't get to really think about is the unique types of harm inflicted um, across those age sex cohorts. As Anthony mentioned, the very specific ones that children face are quite different than working age populations or elderly populations face, or in fact, displaced populations face. So we will be working on all of those more specific applications in the next year or so, and we welcome any thoughts that people may have to uh, to help us and guide us on that on that new study. Thanks very much, uh, Katun. A, a small technical question: uh, Can the uh, data on um, population be separated from international borders? And for instance, in the humanitarian response, could it uh, could you see a, a flow of uh, of refugees say over a border and then calculate things in real time like that is it designed to do that kind of thing i think yeah that's one of the strengths i think of the way that we've set up the the variable is that it's granular enough at the location level where you can sort of pick and choose the areas that you're interested in and not be necessarily bound by country borders or even province level district borders um, so if there is a specific area that you are interested in developing programming for um, or interested in looking at the humanitarian outcomes for that come, that uh, goes over several different border areas, you can use the calculator or you can use um, the, the data itself, the sort of full event data with the population estimates to just filter on those areas and those locations and get a sense of the exposed populations there. Fantastic. And I, I see we're coming to the end of our time, but I would like to just uh, put one more question to Kleena about uh, the, over, the overview. You've, uh, you've built this uh, new tool um, on top of a number of other new tools in recent months. Uh, how are you hoping that policymakers will change the way they view conflict? I mean, what, what, what different approach do you hope to see? Oh, that is a big question. Um... Well, one is that I hope that there's a there's a recognition of the complexity of some of this violence and also, of course, the the variation of its victims. And as Irene was not, just, uh, noting, the the time horizons are are far longer than than I think most of us typically pay attention for. Um, and and conflict is very adaptable to different circumstances. And I don't think that that's quite. Um, that's been ingested necessarily in, in policy or around conflict is that conflict is adaptable and it's not a failure 
of business as usual. It's not a failure of politics. It is, in fact, often a tool of politics. And we need to understand it far more in order to be able to, to pre-estimate who is likely to be affected and try to make sure that that um, people are supported rather than rather than being surprised at the at the number of people and of course the the variation about who is affected. Um, I would like the international community to take far more seriously the shift in the actor types from from insurgents to more militias and gangs and and the exposure that they bring for people um, in part because I don't think we have an answer to those particular problems and those are the growing problems um, across the world not not simply in the global south at all. Well, I think that's an important note to to end our session on. I don't know if any of the any of the participants want to add any last thoughts. Irene, Pablo, Andrew, Andy. And me, Katrina. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for for attending. I'll hand over to Kina to to wave goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the excellent shepherding through the Q and A. Um, thank you very much to our participants, and um, it's been a it's been really insightful to know how you will apply and and be interested in in further refinements of this measure. And of course, thank you to the people, especially World Pop, who has contributed to designing this. And then, of course, um, to those who will use it. We we await your thoughts and your and your use cases, and we hope to hear from you. Thank you again. Goodbye. Thank you for me Goodbye. too. Yeah. Thanks.